This show is supported by you. Stick around for the mid-show ad roll to hear more. This is Kappa Go for February 16th, 2024. Keep up to date with the important happenings in the Go community in about 15 minutes per week. I'm Shai Nachman. And I'm Jonathan Hall. Happy Valentine's Day, I guess. Happy late uh, Valentine's Day. You got your coffee? You woke up early today. <laughs> I got some coffee. I woke up early. One hour early. <laughs> I don't know. Did the time change? I don't think it did. I don't know what happened. I moved the show. You one moved hour. the show. All right. all right. It's all on me. I don't have my Go uh, cup today. Oh, I have my Harry Potter Harry cup Potter. today. Obviously with Hermione, the actual hero of that. Of course. But even without a cup of Go cup, I can still talk Go news. Can you? So we have some proposals to discuss, some interesting blogs, some interesting stuff happening in the industry. Some stuff from the community. Just a, a trail mix of news. Would you say that again? A trail mix Would of I? news. Say that again. Trail mix of news. Say it again. Trail mix of news. Say it, trail say it again like 15 trail times. Mix of news. That's not that hard. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a library function that would just let you repeat things like that? <laughs> <laughs> you Do you remember um, Tom? He's, he used to work at the Recon. We, he mentioned him a few times on the show. Yeah. Tom has a saying. This You have bad ones, but that's one of your worst. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, if you can't get better all the time, you might as well you go the other direction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Slices that repeat. Yeah. Uh, the idea is to be able to create a, a slice with repeating value in it. Is there a lot of discussion? It sounds pretty simple. It sounds like it would be, it's just replacing a for loop basically, right? Is it? I think so. Like if you want to cre- create a repeating slice, so you open a slice and you append in the four, and this is just syntactic sugar over it. So you want to, you have X, right? And you want to repeat it 15 times or whatever. Sounds pretty simple. But wait, what if you have a slice of things that you want to repeat over and over again? Like you have X, Y, Z as three separate things. You want to repeat those a number of times. Ooh. What would that function signature look like? Generic, I assume. And now, wait, do we need two function signatures now? Do we need one for what? repeating a single thing and one for repeating a slice? This is the sort of bike shitting that happened. Damn. So yeah, I, I had the first thought. I had the same thought as you at first. Like, this is easy. Of course, it's no brainer. Let's put it in there. And he has to use the generics. I, I can knock it out in an afternoon. Why? Exactly. <laughs> Why do we need language maintainers? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to go through all of the bike shedding because uh, you know it's been it's been settled. But if you're interested in in how language designers and users of language design simple, trivial features like this that just take a half an hour, go read the issues in the show notes. Uh, all right. Another uh, accepted proposal. This one's really simple. Uh, just nice to see uh, cleanup happening. And it's worth uh, shouting that out is that runtime.goroot is going to be deprecated, which makes sense. If you don't know what goroot is because you joined Go recently enough, then I'm, I'm really jealous. This is a really good place to be in. Yeah. Uh, but a few years ago when you installed Go, you also had to mess around with like a few environment variables and they were always kind of weird the go team had this notion of all your go code living under the same go directory which works if you work at a specific company and you have a big monorepo let's say google but doesn't really work if you just want to open a directory and start hacking on go it was a lot less flexible you don't have a python root on your machine right or a node.js root but for go it, that was the decision and the language slowly moved away from that i think it, it like there was a blog about deprecating it about a year ago uh, just Let's not use uh, GoRoot anymore. Uh, and now the runtime function is going to be deprecated as well because it's not going to be meaningful if uh, copied to another machine and instead just use the system path to find Go. Uh, it was accepted yesterday. Yep. And the topic of paths as strings, which is basically all we do in Go. <laughs> so we talked about GoRoot. Yeah. How about HTTP paths? Yeah. So if you listened last week, we talked about the new... HTTP routing capabilities in Go 122. Of course, we didn't go into a lot of detail. If you'd like some detail, the Go team, Jonathan Amsterdam specifically, on behalf of the Go team, uh, released a blog Jonathan post. Jonathan Amsterdam, which again, important to note, is not you. It's not me. I am Jonathan and I live in Amsterdam, but I am not Jonathan Amsterdam. <laughs> I've never seen you and Jonathan Amsterdam in the same room together. Curious. <laughs> we, we need to get him on the show maybe and, and figure out how this works. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, thanks Jonathan Amsterdam for writing this blog post, but who's not me. But he wrote a blog post explaining the details of the new uh, routing capabilities in Go 122. So that's probably a useful thing for most of us to check out. Yeah, super short, uh, highly technical article, just like uh, we love to see in the Go dev blog. I think the one thing I want to shout out is the last uh, 
the conclusion uh, where he talks about compatibility. He says, we made every effort to keep new functionality compatible with old versions of Go, but there are some edge cases in particular if you have curly braces in your URLs. In the past, they were just translated literally. Uh, this should be very rare that you have curly braces in your URLs, but if you did for some reason, you're probably going to break when you upgrade to 122. So you'll have to, to update that or you'll have to work around that somehow. I guess maybe with some sort of encoding or auto generation, people might have that and they didn't mean to, but I can't in good conscience imagine the path. I'd be like, yeah, curly brace makes sense in this path. Here. Yeah, yeah. On the topic of HTTP services, there's a really, really good, not concise um, <laughs> blog post. It's dense, but it is very long by Matt Ryer about how to write HTTP services in Go. This time it's coming from someone with quite a lot of experience uh, because the title is After 13 Years. And this post is basically a really good uh, blueprint if you want to create the new template for an HTTP service at your company. Just follow all the tips here. I really can't look at one tip here where I, I disagree. Some things include that main only calls run, using a ton of dependency injection with long argument lists. That's a, a really bike shady argument I've had a, a few times. Did you ever write a code review and we're like, this function just gets too many parameters. Let's group some of them into a, a class. I've done that in the past, but not not these days. I actually, I agree with Matt that the long list of parameters is useful because of the type checking. You can't accidentally omit one. And I, I, I do think there's a, a smell to be had when you have too many arguments, but it's not, the solution isn't to switch to a struct. That just hides the smell. It's like sweeping the dirt under the rug. The solution is if you truly have too many arguments, that means your function is doing too many things. I don't think that usually applies to a constructor like in this case, though. Yeah, so there's this sort of really good separation that comes out in this blog post as well when you have sort of graph creation code where you just take all the inited things and hook them up together and you don't do any logic. You're just like, some people call it manager, some people call it constructor, some people call it graph creation versus all the rest, which is like your business logic. And in all the rest, this is a smell, but in the like big init functions and, and wrappers, I totally agree that just adding all the stores, adding all the services, the config, the logger, all the middlewares, all the like whatever is a really good idea. Decoding and encoding, do it in one place, uh, validate your data. That also makes sense. And I really think that there's a lot of good tips here that could be ap applicable, even if you don't take them as is. Mm -hmm. For example, for in decoding and encoding and validating data, if I were to write a Go service from scratch today, I would probably do it in a gRPC and I would use a gRPC validate for validating yeah. data. This still adheres to these like these tips, but it doesn't follow them exactly. I think the, the core of these tips are really, really, really good. And there was a lot of talk in our channel about the middlewares, right? That was a topic that caught people's attention at the Cup of Go channel. Yeah. I never thought about it so hard. Why, why do people care so much? Well, I, I think it, as a newcomer to Go, it's confusing to have like a typical middleware has a function that returns a closure that returns a closure, which is kind of confusing. Until you recognize the pattern, and then it, and then it kind of, I think, falls into place in your head, and it makes sense, and it, and it feels good. But until then, I know I struggled with it for a long time. Like, what, what is, what are these different layers? It feels like you're in this in inception or something, you know? I understand. I think definitely reading it. This post assumes that you know Go pretty well, and yeah. that you've written quite a few HTTP services before. It's not a tutorial. Uh, so if you're a newcomer, um, I would put aside two days to read this, but I would put them aside. It's really, really worth it. And finally, the post ends with like putting all these into practice. So in larger organizations and bigger projects, there are constraints of the real world. Uh, this post comes from Grafana Labs. So, you know, there are gRPC practices uh, and tools, abstractions in gRPC. Grafana uses gRPC. So you just go pragmatically and go with the flow, even if it doesn't necessarily fit into all these, you know, tips, for example, using inline request response types. But overall, this is a really, really good uh, blog post. I think it shows the, the huge gap between, oh, I can do uh, like production services with the standard library and how much work actually goes into you know, a proper modern HTTP service. But honestly, it's just a super great blog post. Highly recommend. Awesome. I like Matt Ryer's blog post in general. So yeah, check it out. Cool. So we have some more uh, community stuff to, to talk about, right? 
Yeah, this one's a little bit less awesome. I don't know. Have you ever used Flux or Weaveworks? I've used Argo CD. You've used Argo CD. Yeah, You're, who's eating their lunch or has has eaten their lunch, I guess. So we, uh, if anybody uses Kubernetes, uh, you may be familiar with. If anybody ever heard on this, it's the tiny project yeah. from it's a new open source project from Google <laughs> called Kubernetes. <laughs> Some people will deploy Kubernetes with this tool called Flux. It's a GitOps thing. Basically, you can throw a, a stack of YAML at Kubernetes, and it just makes it happen. Kind of. I mean, it's really oversimplifying. The company behind Flux, Flux is an open source project. The company behind Flux, WeaveWorks, has announced they are shutting down operations. Didn't have the the revenue necessary, uh, a, an acquisition fell through at the last minute. So if you are a Flux user, uh, I mean, Flux is open source, it will still be there, but probably won't be getting much updates. WeaveWorks, the the SaaS behind we uh, behind Flux is going out of business or, or has gone out of business. I don't know exactly the timeline. This announcement was dated February 5th. So it's kind of sad to see that happen. Flux is a CNCF project. So I mean, it's not vanishing, but I do imagine it will get a lot less uh, development work. It'll probably become more of a community project, I'm guessing. And yeah, I think most people are switching to or, or are using Argo CD these days, which I haven't used yet. So I don't know exactly how it compares feature to feature or whatever, but yeah, it's a little bit sad to see it happen. We don't usually link to LinkedIn, just not the type of uh, links we usually link to. But the post from the CEO is kind of, he's obviously worked up about it. And uh, there are some comments from really interesting people here. Liz Rice, I don't know. I watched her videos to learn about what is Docker. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And just people who seem to be impacted or, or, you know, care about WeaveWorks. It's not just the project, it's also the people behind it. Argo CD is like going great. I'm working uh, on integrating Argo CD to Orca right now. So I really think it, it's not like GitOps is uh, going down. I just think we're consolidating to a single solution. Mm-hmm. There is one interesting thing in that regard. You know how you always look up X versus Y when you're, for example, if if someone wanted the GitHub solution right now, they would probably end up Googling uh, Argo CD versus alternatives or Flux yeah. alternatives or Argo CD versus Flux. Mm-hmm. When you look that up, you see a ton of uh, posts, right, called Flux versus Argo CD. What should you choose? It's amazing to me how much all of these are invalidated now. Now that yeah. one project is like financially backed and, and CNCF and everything. And one is just an open source project, not the same uh, level of commitment, I would say. I also get a lot of Flux versus Redux, which I guess is uh, something that front end developers will understand. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> Flux is a different, it's a state management for, for front end. And you shouldn't use any of them anyway. Yeah, right, so right. You should use Sagas. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> we're not a front end podcast. But if you have a Redux and you're not migrating to Mobex, maybe you're, maybe you should uh, rethink your life. And if you are, maybe you should rethink your life and write go some Go instead. There you go. <laughs> um, I found this interesting thing on Reddit where one of the users posted that Go 122, which we've talked about last week, is yielding an 18% regression in single threading performance. And I was like, oh no, they fucked something up. Yeah. Like it's, a, it's not good. But luckily, uh, this user decided to post on the subreddit instead of just reporting an issue and got some feedback, you know, some peer review from the Reddit community that basically shared that two small sample sizes are not relevant. It's just changes in the in the jump alignment between builds and every program that's over 60k lines, the time is exactly the same. So no, Go 122 doesn't have an 18% regression, even though that was the title of this post. But in small sample sizes, it might. The main culprit that they tried to look at was the loop var fix because they go change how loops uh, work. And there's some interesting investigation here in the comments. But overall, seems like everything uh, below 60K is too short and above 60K, everything's great. So it looks like, no, Go 122 doesn't have a big degradation in performance and you shouldn't have a problem upgrading. Um, but a good work on, on on behalf of that redditor, right? Yeah. Instead of just running to the Go team for not being uh, toxic here. I mean, I, I like to rag on Reddit, but this was a very civil discourse, I think. So good job. Could could have been a Slack thread for all I know. <laughs> uh, one last uh, community thing we wanted to discuss, right? Yeah. Some YouTube content. So uh, I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have heard of, if not watch regularly. The Primetime YouTube channel by the, the, the Primogen. Is that how he says his name? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
his moniker. So he has a new video out came out uh, yesterday called Why I Use Golang in 2024, which is kind of interesting. I mean, he's talked about Go several times in the past, but he's, he I think he works at Netflix. He talks about Rust a lot. And he, he just reviews uh, your content, blog posts and stuff. Uh, other people are, I shouldn't say reviews, he more like uh, reacts to. But he talks a lot about Go and some of the things he likes about it. And he talks a lot about Rust and the things he loves about it. So this 10-minute video, it's an it's, uh, easy, quick watch. He talks about why he's switching from Rust to Go in 2024. And to be clear, it's not because he hates Rust. There's no Rust hate in this video at all. He loves Rust. But it's an interesting watch. I mean, I think, I think the main point he makes is the idea that Go is sort of designed to be a simple language to be productive. And he wants to give that a shot before he has a full verdict on whether he likes Go or not. So he says he's going to try using Go for when he has the choice, he's going to use Go for the next year or two. Yeah, I'm curious to see how that goes. I'd love to watch a follow-up video in a a year or whatever and and see his response to that after he's he's done this experiment. Maybe we can get him on the show and and, uh, ask him directly. That'd be fun too. At least on YouTube. I don't watch a lot of YouTube, but I do follow uh, a few uh, programmers on YouTube. A prime time and there's some people who make like uh you know comedy videos about programming fireship io does this like really short form you know tech videos which i like x in 60 seconds and no boilerplate uh is a is a dude who's doing uh videos about rust and whenever i watch programming content on youtube i feel like oh I have to do Rust. Why am I not doing Rust? Everybody's doing <laughs> Rust for everything, and and all the all the world is getting oxidized. And I, I then I go back to my corporate job where people are, uh, are complaining about even using Python and not yeah. configuring everything with JSON files and web interface. And I'm like, okay, in reality, we're far away from everybody writing Rust for everything all the time. It's really, 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 really hard and not uh, very like very strict. And not relevant for many use cases. But Go is relevant for, at least in my opinion, for many more use cases. And you can knock out stuff really, really quickly. You need a CLI thing? Sure. You need an HTTP service? You don't need, now you can just use the standard library, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's really productive. I just hope that it's sort of boring. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, we shouldn't say that as a Go news show. Yeah, the, this topic of is, is boring. But I mean boring in the sense that usually you write a thing in Go, it'll probably work. Like it'll probably not crash. I have some rust in in production myself. It doesn't crash as well. It just took a lot more effort to write. Mm-hmm. And I just wish uh, Prime Time will have a good time with uh, Go this year. He colored his hair a uh, Go for blue, so you know yep. he's already on the right path. Awesome, cool. So that's what we have for you all this week. Stick around though. We have an interview coming up today, the first time this year uh, with Daniel Marti. So stick around for that. Should be interesting. Talk to you there. This show is supported by you. Woo-hoo. We want to welcome two new Patreon members to our uh, Cup of Go Club. Thanks a lot for your support, uh, Thomas Bruno and Wilkan Rivera, which we had on the show before. Shout out, brother. Thanks for uh, supporting us. If you want to learn more about the show, you can find us on the web at cupago.dev. That is cupogo.dev. Uh, and we usually hang around with uh, our community at the Gopher Slack, hashtag cupogo with hyphens. If you're into email, you can email us at news at cupago.dev. If you want to support the show, buying merch on our store or joining on Patreon is the best way to do so. This is a pretty expensive hobby and uh, we rely on your support to keep it up. And other ways to support us include uh, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcasts uh, and put the word out. Our last episode about Go122 was almost our best release window ever. Uh, probably because it's a very shareable episode. It just talks about the new things in 122, which is something that most people who program in, in Go care about. So if you're looking for a specific episode to share, maybe that one could be a good one. Thanks a lot for listening uh, and stick around for the interview with Daniel Marti. Looking forward to it. Jonathan, are you ready to start the interview? I am. All right, so I'll give you a cue and we could start. So, okay. so I just need someone who can tell me about Q. Anyone? You know anyone? So I can give I you do. a I Q think know so we can Q. start the interview. Daniel, do you know anything about Q? A little bit. Yeah? <laughs> Hi, Daniel. Hello. Nice to be here. Welcome to this cheesy show that we do. <laughs> so Daniel Marti, did I say that right? Is it Marti? Yep. Uh, is our guest today. Uh, Daniel, you have your fingers in a lot of pies, I think. But before we talk about those pies, would you do a brief introduction, let our audience who doesn't know who you are, know about you, what your relationship is to the Go language, the Go 
project and, and all that fun stuff. So my name is Daniel. You might know me as MV Dan online. And I did start coding in Go, geez, about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I have been contributing here and there, never full time, sort of on, on, on the sidelines. And in the last couple of years, I've been involved in Q, a configuration language built on Go. So there's some over, a significant overlap there. Cool. We have uh, quite a few projects we want to get into, but I think Jonathan has a, has a favorite he wants to ask you about first. Which is oh, go no. fumped. No. Not go fumped, go fumped. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that because somebody just this morning mentioned, why did you call the tool go fumped? It's so confusing. And I'm like, yes, that's precisely why I called it that. <laughs> 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 because I used to call the original go fumped go FMT. Mm -hmm. And then somebody told me, no, no, it's pronounced go fumped. And I was like, well, then just call it go fumped in writing. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. the sort of uh, extremely pedantic uh, conversations I expect someone who developed the GoFump to have <laughs> um, Jonathan since this is pr probably one of your favorite tools what is GoFump are, are you asking me yeah you want me to explain what GoFump is and see if I, if I can if, if get Daniel it right grades you, yeah, if, if you're hitting uh, the nail on the head it's a stricter version of GoFump but it's GoFump what? Is GoFump. <laughs> yeah. So it's so a stricter it, it, version it, of Go FMT. If I'm not mistaken, it's a fork of the official GoFump. It's added some stricter formatting rules to tighten up certain, you know, white space in certain places, and you know, there's, there's a couple dozen rules, I guess. But uh, so, Daniel, why develop a different formatter? Go already ships with a built-in formatter, which is one of the things you know people will talk about in Go. Oh, everything's batteries included, everything's built in. You don't have to like install, you know, black and flake eight and iSort and all that, for example, in Python, you just get it out of the box. Why did you feel the need to fork it? Yeah, out of all the projects I've started on GitHub, GoFund is maybe the one that's most polarizing because some people say, yes, I, I love the extra rules, thank you. And some other people say, why did you start this? It's just like split the formatting world in two. I kind of see both sides. I wouldn't really say that I split the formatting of Go in, into two camps because I deliberately made GoFund backwards compatible with Go FMT, meaning that if one of your developers chooses to use the stricter tool, the stricter tool and the original tool are not going to fight each other. It's just that one will want to go a little bit further, but it's they're, they're not going to like collide or conflict with each other. Another choice that I made is, because it is in a way a fork of GoFMT, it follows the same philosophy of no options, of the same command line interface and so on. So it is pretty much a drop-in replacement. And what was it about GoFMT that you didn't think was, quote, good enough or strict enough or whatever. What, why did you choose to make this for? So it, it is going to sound slightly <laughs> pedantic if I say this, but at a previous job, uh, I was doing a lot of code reviews. I was in a sort of team lead position. Uh, and a lot of the people that were sending me code to review came from other languages. So they wrote Go code as if it were another language, if, if you will. And most of that is, is not style. Most of that is things like naming variables or how you structure your types and methods and things like that and files as well. Uh, but quite a lot of it was just because they were used to, for example, you know, languages like C or Java or Python, you just style your code differently. And if you pass that through GoFund, so the original GoFMT, it deals with a lot of that, but some of it just like doesn't care, leaves it alone. And I kept seeing patterns of like, oh, I would delete this empty line. Oh, I would just join these lines. Oh, I would blah, blah, blah. And then I, the, I'm a very lazy person. So the 10th time I would have to suggest something, I would just be like, I, I can't be bothered. I, I want something to just do it for me, right? Mm -hmm. So th mm -hmm. that was the source of it. And I, I know that Robert, the author of Go, GoFMT and Maintainer, I know he wants to add more rules to the to the upstream tool, but at the same time, he's somebody that, that has to maintain 20 different things. And he was also at the time developing the early prototype of generics, right? So mm -hmm. improving GoFMT was very, very low on his list. And even today it is, for obvious reasons. So I, I thought... It's not like I'm going against him or like I'm, go I'm trying to overrule him. But at the same time, I treat my tool as like an experimentation place. And then it's very much the intent that if, for example, half of the rules that I have are a good idea, he can, well, he's more than welcome to copy them. I, I do not care. Cool. I, I hope that does happen. Like consolidating all the rules and having stricter formatting is like you say it's, uh, you know, you were lazy and you wanted to have more uniform CRs, but. When you're in a team lead position and you do a lot of code reviews, I can definitely feel you. Like having uniform, just ways to look at things and the pattern recognition is easier, uh, makes it easier for everyone. By the way, including LLMs, we've mentioned this a few times on the show, but the fact that Go has a, you know, a format that's un, you can't argue with, 
and you can't really configure too much and also uses tabs in sp- instead of spaces is super good for code generation uh just a lot cheaper which is nice so go fund I just wanted to get that out of the way because it's Jonathan's uh, probably favorite uh, tool. Um, <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's quite true, but it, it is a, it is a one I like a lot. So, but you mentioned you're working on Q, right? We're planning to have uh, another maintainer of uh, Q on the show. Paul uh, Paul is scheduled to come up uh, on the show in March. So, oh, cool. Yeah, so so we're gonna have two views on Q. Um, but why another configuration language? Again, YAML is good enough. Isn't JSON good enough? It's a good question. And there's like, if there's many opinions about what a programming language should do, there's even more about what a configuration language should do. Because there's there's camps of people who say configuration languages should be as dumb as possible, in a way. So mm-hmm. think like JSON, right? JSON does not have references, does not have any logic whatsoever, does not even have comments, right? Some people go even further with things like INI or TUML, uh, which is just like, you know, like a list of key values of you, in a way. And then there's camps of people that say, I want configuration as code. So they might use something like Python or languages that are somewhere in the middle, like I keep forgetting the name, but Starlark, I think, Mm -hmm. is like a version of Python that's specifically aimed for configuration. And then there's configuration languages that say, well, we're kind of like code, but we're not Turing complete. So so we, we allow you to do some things like conditionals and loops. But we don't allow you to, for example, loop forever or like write a kernel in this, right? And I, I think that's where some languages like HCL and Q try to sit. So I, I would say those are the three main camps. And I would say that there's not enough. My opinion is that for projects or companies or orgs that are large enough, simple languages are not enough. And you have to be really careful with any language that's too powerful because then that's essentially how you get into trouble because configuration just gets A, too complicated to understand, but B, also too too expensive to compute. So that is when you need this middle ground of a language that lets you do more than just dumb configuration languages, but not so much that you just you know waste CPU cycles trying to evaluate what the hell is happening. So there's a new, very new, I guess, I don't want to say competitor because it's like both open source and they're both fine. But there is a new library out by Apple called Pickle, which is, it's called PKL, which is even a worse choice than GoFumpt because at least the GoFumpt, you meant it to like go over the same thing. But there's Python Pickle and now there's Apple's Pickle, which is not related to Python's Pickle package at all. I wouldn't be able to say that sentence again fast. And I'm wondering like how much overlap there is between uh, Q and, and Pickle. Like if are they direct competitors? Is there like sort of features that uh, Q has that Pickle doesn't? What reason would I have to pick one over the other in case, you know, I, I decided I want to be serious about my, you know, configuration, like a database connection string. I really want to configure it correctly this time. That is a good question, and I think that should definitely be one to say for Paul, because I haven't looked at Pickle with much depth. All I know is that they take different approaches, mainly because Q takes a somewhat, a somewhat unique approach in that it's, a, it's a, a configuration language built around unification, and that is actually where the name Q comes from, configure, unify, evaluate, even though maybe that's not the best way to <laughs> name a language, but that's what it is. And it's it's a bit... It's a bit special in the sense that you know how, for example, in Go, you can compose interfaces. So in a way, in Q, you can compose values. So you can take one value, another value, and then unify them, and that gives you a new value. And there's, as far as I know, there's no other like mainstream configuration language that works like this. Some others instead do inheritance, which is the more classic way with programming languages as well. I'm not going to say one of them is strictly better than the other one, but they're definitely very different. And they both have pros and cons. And you, like there are users of uh, Q, you know, on the, at least there are logos on the, on the homepage is, are they like contributing a lot of code back? Do they have a lot of complaints or is it like, yeah, Q as it is, is kind of fine and it's sort of done. I believe the companies that are listed on the website that are mainly the big users, you could say. Um, in terms of contributors, we have people contributing on GitHub and Garrett all over the place. Including me. <laughs> yeah, to, to the point that sometimes we get pull requests or, or patches and it's only weeks later that we realize, oh, that person works at that company, right? Because with open source, unless they put it in their profile, you don't, you sometimes don't tell. Mm-hmm. I, I guess I should add my company to my <laughs> GitHub profile. That's always a problem, right? Because when you join a company, Jonathan, you're, you're doing uh, work with uh, tons of companies, right? Because you're freelancing mostly. 
Yeah. So do you use your main GitHub or they, they force you to open like a company email? I prefer to use my main one. I usually add the company email to it though, so I can get those emails at my company. I have like three GitHub accounts at this point, all of them with like slightly different open source contributions. It's kind of annoying to, okay, so go to this one and go to that one. Cool. If I have config uh, files right now at work and I'm frustrated, should I try to migrate to Q like, and, and do that uh, change? Or is it mostly for, okay, I have a new project, so now it's, it's worth checking it out? It's a good question. Um, Q is built in a way that is like a superset of JSON, very much on purpose. And YAML is also a superset of JSON. So in a way, if your project already uses JSON or YAML in some way, switching to Q or starting to use Q in some parts of your, for example, CI pipeline or Go code and so on, it should be possible without you having to throw everything away and start from, from scratch. At the same time, if you want to get the full advantage of, of this new paradigm of configuration language and unification, you probably should change the way you think about configuration a little bit. Because, for example, Q can do both schemas and data, whereas if you think about YAML or JSON, they're mainly about data. And then there are things like JSON schema, which is like schema as data, right? But it's fairly static and, and very much different. In Q, everything is the same. It's not like a strict separation between tabs and values. Everything is like in a spectrum between the two in the form of constraints, for example. So I would say it's perfectly fine for an existing project to incorporate bits of Q. And I've done that at work many times before, because if, if I'm an employee at a company, it, it's not reasonable for me, for me to say, hey, please, everybody stop. And I'm going to change how we do configuration. Like that's not something that's reasonable, right? But at the same time, if you want to take full advantage, I would say it's not like you have to throw JSON and YAML out of the window. So you could do it like gradual uh, change. Right. Cool. I, I, this is, I guess, the best foot in the door for a lot of companies, right? Okay, so we have this sort of new project that's currently in alpha. Let's use Q there. And if it works well, maybe we can port it back to other configurations until it uh, completely yes. takes everything over. And I can give a brief example. At a previous company, we had a, a CI YAML configuration that was like 500 lines of code <laughs> or 500 lines of YAML. And it scared the bejesus out of me <laughs> because um, a lot of those CI steps had dependencies between them because we would build like 20 services, test them, and then deploy them, right? So each of those steps had to have dependencies. And a few times developers, because we're like just monkeys typing on a keyboard, we would forget one of those dependencies and then we would deploy something that doesn't pass the tests, right? Mm -hmm. So I wrote some queue constraints that would take that YAML as input, uh, as a value, and that would say for every step, with name service deploy X, check that it depends on a step called service test X, right? You can do constraints like that on existing data. And I would also do things like check that all the services that we test are also built, check that all the services that we build are named in a particular way and have a directory that exists in this place. There's lots of things that I could sanity check. Really cool. Sounds super useful, I guess. I, I'll just I'll just use this uh, platform before we move. Uh, Jonathan moves us to the next topic. Just to use this platform to recommend everyone to at least check out the site. There's a really good documentation. Just wait until there's this one pull request that fixed a broken link. Just wait until it get merged, and then you can check it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Now I'm frantically thinking. Oh no! Where's that pull request? <laughs> <laughs> I I fucked up. I opened it without uh, reading the the contributing guide. It's my it's my fault. My fault. <laughs> so I want to talk about another project. This seems to be following a theme of I don't know if you would agree if this is sort of the trajectory your public projects take that you take an existing idea and try to make it better. So the project is sh or sh. Maybe again describe what the project is and then we'll talk about you know the applications of it. So the project is it started as a parser for the shell language meaning POSIX shell and or bash. And I did that fairly year, like many years ago because I wanted to learn about parsers. And I saw that Go's parser was written by hand. And I, I was straight out of uni. And at uni, I had been taught, you never want to write parsers by hand. You just automate it with tools. Mm -hmm. And I honestly found that kind of boring because I, it felt like I was learning a tool and learning how to debug and fight the tool more so than writing code. And I'm not going to say there's no advantages to using a tool. There definitely are. But I, I always like just doing things by hand and learning how it works from the ground mm -hmm. up. So I thought, well, I'm just going to use write one for shell. In hindsight, that wasn't the best idea because shell is not a very good language in terms of syntax. It's not like you can write a lexer and then a parser on top of it. 
everything is like kind of a big mess of, of I'm, I'm not going to, in a way you cannot lex, like you cannot tokenize on its own. You have to do the whole parsing as a, as a single step, if that makes mm-hmm. sense, mm-hmm. as you read the bytes. But that is how it started, just with me having lots of free time and just wanting to play with it. And then on top of that, I started thinking, oh, it could be nice to also be able to format shell syntax. And then I was like, oh, it would be nice if I copied the GoFMT idea and I wrote a shell formatter. And then from that, somebody asked, hey, it would be nice to have an interpreter. So I also wrote one. But a lot of this is best effort. Like I could, I would say I've probably implemented 70, 80% of Bash in terms of what most people use. But Bash as a language and as a, an interpreter, as a shell, it has a tail end of features that nobody knows about and nobody uses. Mm-hmm. Or some people use, but I, I don't have the time to implement all of those, of course. <laughs> is there a practical application then for using a Go interpreter for Bash scripts, or is it just a, a hobby, a fun project? For me, it's mainly a hobby project. I spend as much time as I want on it, which these days is not a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because Shell, is, Shell can be a little bit infuriating to use, so it's even more infuriating to implement <laughs> in yeah. many cases. Like, for example, splitting words into fields, into strings, right? Um, it's, it's surprisingly difficult to get right. I, I've had to re-implement it a, a few times. I would say that Shell as a language, like it's, it's very much hated by many people, and it deserves that, some of that hate. But at the same time, it's ubiquitous, right? It's in many places. Um, right. And I think, I think having tooling to be able to deal with it better than nothing or better than just bash the tool, because bash the tool, it can interpret, and, but that's it. it. It doesn't let you do anything else, right? So having, having some more tools in this space, I think, is good. And, I, and I, think, I think it's perfectly fine that some companies and some projects build on Shell, even with its deficiencies. You're saying that this is like a small hobby project, but looking at the release notes, uh, at least for the version from five days ago, looks more serious than a lot of uh, open source projects with uh, companies behind them. I'm wondering, are all these contributions yours or are more people like jumping on the bandwagon and contributing to uh, SH? It's a bit of both. I've started a number of open source projects uh, with various ideas in terms of whether I want this to be a personal project versus a community project, if you will. This one is one of the earlier ones I started. I, I never intended for it to become a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I, I was only trying to learn about stuff and just ex- experiment. Some people have started building stuff on top of it. So they want to pull me in different directions saying, hey, can you please do this or that? Or just code reviews. I'm perfectly happy with it as long as they don't expect too much of me. But th- these days, I think the balance is pretty comfortable. I'm happy to review code. I'm happy for people to ask that I prioritize certain certain things. There's even a couple of companies that sponsor me on GitHub because they build something on top of, of the project. But it's it's definitely not in exchange for my time or anything like that. Um, I don't set those expectations. There are a lot of related projects like wrappers and uh, stuff like that at the end. People like wrapped it for VS Code, Emacs, Sublime, Trunk, Vim, and you know it's included in some other hooks, pre-commits. Like, seems like you could use SH to format your shell files, even if you don't know that it's your learning project, just by mistake by installing one of these plugins, right? Uh, as recommended. Do you know how much usage does this project actually get, like in day to day? Do you have like analytics or anything? There's no analytics, uh, but I would definitely say that the shell formatter program is the most used part of it. Like the interpreter, for example, I would say is far less used. Also because it's far less complete. It's much easier to write a formatter for Shell than an interpreter. Because a formatter, for example, the built-ins and the options doesn't care. They're just strings, right? Um, You don't have to implement all the logic inside them. I would say the formatter is fairly well established. My main metric being that it's packaged in pretty much everywhere. All the Linux distros and and Brew and, and Windows and stuff. So that tells me that there's enough demand um, out in the world, it sounds. I, I wasn't aware that that existed. I think uh, it sounds attractive. I'm going to have to have a have a look at that and see if I can use it to make some of my shell scripts a little more consistent. Something I will mention is that there's a caveat section in the README <laughs> because something I learned fairly early on is that, like I said, shell as a language as a syntax is not super well designed. So it actually, the spec actually requires you to backtrack as you parse shell, a uh, POSIX shell. Uh, because for example, if you start, if you open two parentheses, it's ambiguous whether that means whether you're starting an arithmetic command, like an arithmetic expression, or if you're starting two subshells, one within the other. They're both valid options. This 
So and you have to like go back and see if there's a dollar sign at the beginning and stuff like that to to figure that out. No, no. Um, even without the dollar sign, without a dollar sign, if you open two left to open parentheses in Bash, that means an arithmetic command. So you you do some arithmetic and you get the result as as like success or failure, pretty much. So if you do that in Bash, what Bash does as an implementation is it tries one path, and if that doesn't parse correctly, it tries the other path. Ooh. But but a, a parser that backtracks is fairly slow and complex because you could be retrying half the script for all you know, right? And you could be retrying multiple times in a nested way. So for example, Go as a syntax is very much designed to not be ambiguous. And that is a great thing because then a, a lexer can just like always continue and it, it, it always has a, it will always finish in one pass, you can say. I'm like wondering in between the this topic and that topic that uh, we're jumping between, if uh, I were to, you know, start a new development team with you, how would the developer tooling look like? <laughs> I'm used to just someone opening a scripts folder. It's just a bunch of SH files, no linting, no anything. And that carries you until you're like 20 people. But I imagine, you know, with all the stuff we've mentioned, it seems like we would be like, okay, let's model our data first in, in queue and let's write some uh, command line tools in Go. And it would go much more that way than just let's just hack a bunch of uh, shell scripts together to set up our, I don't know, CI pipelines and our deployment scripts and all that. Uh, I'm talking about like the basic developer tooling, not even talking about like the main product. I'm, I'm actually not that. Maybe I was more strict and opinionated like 10 years ago when I started a lot of this. But th- these days I'm fairly lax in the sense of I just want to get stuff done. If I have to, for example, uh, automate something quickly in CI, I will write shell inside YAML, which is horrible. But I, I will be fine with that as a starting point. And the moment it starts giving me pain, it is when, when I will get rid of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. But I, I'm not in, of the opinion that these tools have to be used everywhere. They can be used as long as you get value out of them, uh, which I would say is once teams teams hit a certain size where formatting starts being really important, right? So very programmatic, I guess. That reminds me of a question I wanted to ask you for a while, talking about uh, how you set up a project automation. Uh, and, and I don't remember how this came up. We were having a chat on, on Slack when you made a, just a passing comment that you're not a big fan of Golang CI Lint. I'm curious, and I, I'm not asking for for shade on on the project unless you really want to give that. But I'm curious what you what you use to lint your Go projects, if anything. It's a very good question. Like linting in Go has gone through many ebbs and flows. Mm-hmm. Like way back in the day, it was only Go vet and Go lint, which were both official uh, projects from from Go, like official commands. And Go vet has always been amazing. I continue to enforce it everywhere. Go lint was never good. <laughs> mm-hmm. that, that shouldn't be a, a controversial thing to say because it, it said lots of things that weren't really issues, right? It was very aggressive and it, it was just like all over the place. Um, many of the things it said were just like stylistic nets, if you will. And we had, we've had other tools, many other tools over the years. Um, and I wrote some of them as well, even though I decided against them and just um, archived some of them <laughs> since. But these days, I mainly enforce GoVet and uh, Static Check. Those are the, the two ones that are pretty much everywhere. Mm-hmm. The reasoning being that, at least in my experience, those are the two that have a fairly high standard in terms of false positives and in terms of quality. One aspect in which they differ is that GoVet only wants to invest the time in writing checks and maintaining checks that will fire fairly often. So they only one of the criteria for checks in Vet is that this has to be a problem that's fairly widespread, where a static check will say, no, no, we have many more checks. We don't really care that much about that. Even if that check only fires like 10 times in the corpus of public Go code, that's still fine with us. We just want to have as, as wide a set of a suite of checks as possible, as long as they're good quality and, and so on. And Golang CI Lint, um, it takes a slightly different approach of it wants to be a meta linter. And there, ha- there have been meta linters in Go before. Um, I remember one, I, th- I believe, by Alec Thomas called Go Meta Linter, which I did use back in the day. And the idea is to have a collection of third-party linters that do various things and then collect them together in a way that they're easy to run all, all together, all at once. I think my main concern with Golang CI Lint is that it does that in a way that it mixes tools of very different tolerances of false positives and quality and, and goals, right? So for example, if you run Golang CI Lint with every single linter that it includes, which many people do, I would say that probably half of what it's going to tell you to do is not really 
like a, an issue that you need to solve. It's like opinions or nets or sometimes even false positives that are not even something to fix. Yeah, I mean, I I, I do use Golang CLN, but I find that I kind of have to babysit the config to. Well, for one thing, you find some rules that contradict each other. You know, one one says you should uh, name every every variable in a function, and so others say, another one says that you should collapse those that have the same type. And you know, so they uh, obviously you can't have both of them enabled at the same time. And which one do you choose? I mean, someone has to decide, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of GoFumped in the first place, right? And then you have this other problem that if, if you're running static check and revive they have some overlapping rules and you're going to either have slightly different versions of the same rule with one versus the other or you need to go in and manually disable one of the versions or something like that so you know there's it's a bit of a chore to keep it to keep it working and then uh you know whenever a new version comes out and things change you have to go and babysit all that again so there is definitely something attractive about sticking with something like whether it's static check or go critic or whatever sticking with one of them uh, i could see being a very attractive option Something I will say is that some of those tools I do use occasionally, but I, I use them as like queries to see, let me see what they find. And I'm going to cherry pick some yeah. things to fix, but I don't enforce them. Whereas static check and vet, sometimes they have bugs and I report them for false positives and things like that, but they're very rare. <laughs> In general, I can just enforce them and forget about it, which is exactly what you're saying. I've recently talked to someone who does dev tooling and she mentioned that many of the tools that aren't like perfect and you have to babysit and you want to do for like go lengthy island, uh, you know, with just everything on or something like that. It's a good idea to have one version that's a blocking gate. So for example, I run Golang CI Lint with a config that just gives a static check and, and vet and that's it. Or maybe just not even use Golang CI Lint for that. And like Daniel, like you're saying, just run that. But like every night, for example, just run uh, Golang CI Lint on the change files from yesterday and see what it finds. And if you want, you know, if you look at that report every day and you find someone who like a line that you're looking at it, like, oh, maybe we should fix it. It shouldn't be a blocking like quality gate that stops developers from developing, but you know, looking at it uh, every night could be useful. I think it's a shift that many people don't do. Like, we want to add as many blocking quality gates as possible. That's like an approach you can have. The more automated checks, the better. But that's not actually true, especially if you run the same rules or they're conflicting or whatever. It, it could be very frustrating. But moving it to a lagging indicator is fine because just like uh, you said, you can check it at your pace and not whenever you want to open a pull request suddenly. A new rule introduced to a linter you didn't even know about two days ago and was updated in Golexi Alit, now you have to deal with. Yep, definitely agreed. Although I will also say that even for tools that you don't enforce, if their rate of noise is too high, they still become useless in my eyes. And this is what happened with GoLint. I think this is what killed GoLint. One of, one of its rules back in the day was every single declaration has to be documented. And honestly, I would run this at work and it would complain about so much code that A, was private or, or B, was not never intended to be like a library, right? It was only for, uh, for example, part of the main package or maybe it was only imported in a single place. Uh, or maybe it was used like three lines further down and it was like fairly self-evident. I do think, like I get the point, like in general, you should document everything. But in practice, that only applies to public facing API for modules, right? Like for the rest, it doesn't really matter that much. Yeah, this is not really Go, but uh, Rough, the the Rust linter for Python, you know what I'm talking about from Astral? They just released a new version where they deprecated some rules that everybody disabled, which I was very happy to see. They disabled uh, that you have to add the type for self on a class because no one would do that. It's self. You, and what you would write is self, colon, self. Doesn't help anyone. Same for class. They just figured out that every, every single user is disabled that uh, linter rule, so they deprecated it. Again, as a meta linter, you can sort of make these decisions that I think that the best practice for the language is X, which is what happens when you run the meta linter with no arguments, right? It ends up being very opinionated. But again, if you move the noisy rules out of the way, can be useful. Agreed. So Daniel, one thing I've... I've noticed about you is that your name pops up a lot in the Go issue tracker. You seem to be active in proposals and you know giving feedback and you, know, you seem to be pretty active. I that tells me you have your finger on the pulse a little bit uh, of the Go project. Do you have any insights you'd like to share about now that one twenty two is out and we're done talking about that forever? One twenty three, we should be about six months away. Um, what kind of insights or thoughts do you have on on the future of Go? I'm fairly optimistic with the fact that recent releases have done have brought a lot. We had a, a group of Go releases where they were focused on generics, 
And they were fairly conservative in terms of changing the language or adding big features. Whereas now it feels like generics is done. And now they're getting a lot of stuff done that is like a quality of life improvement type of thing. Like, for example, the new HTTP router that we got on 122, that you could say that should have happened five years ago because it's it's such a relief, right? But at the same time, I'm so glad that it's finally being done. And I think we will continue to having releases like that maybe for the next a few years, maybe like there's a cyclic thing where in a few, in a couple of years they will say, okay, let's do something big like generics again and just stop messing with little things. But I, I am very happy to see things like, for example, the V2 of Math Rand is also very good. Structured logging was also a pain to deal with before we had a standard one. There's also encoding JSON v2, <laughs> even though that's a different beast. So, but I'm really happy that the project is tackling these, what you could say, little things, which are not so little. They they add up. They add up. Yeah. And and something I would recommend as well in terms of following what things are happening. I started doing this by just reading the commits that went into master because I, I was using Go. I wanted to contribute, but you're always in this position where you say, I don't know where to start or I don't even know what's happening. Like, I don't know why they're doing the things they're doing or, or how they're doing them. So I, I did start following the issue tracker, but I, I think reading the commits that went into master was the most useful in terms of understanding. Also because they write good commit messages. So even to somebody that is not super experienced with Go, you can read the context and usually understand most of what's happening. Is there anything that jumps out at you? I know it's still early in the cycle, but that, that's already been merged or that is on, on the horizon to be included in 123 that you think is, is worth calling out? I think they're spending quite a lot of effort on PGO these days, um, the, the compiler and runtime team, you could say, because PGO oh. already <laughs> PGO already landed in, I can't remember if it was 121 or 122, uh, but for now it's only been used for fairly simple things, but now they're saying, okay, it's time for the compiler's function call in liner to get a lot better. And the way they're making it a lot better is with PGO information. Um, so up until now, it was fairly static in, in in terms of guessing what function calls should be inlined in a static way. Whereas for 123, uh, there's an issue called overhaul the inliner. And, and the main idea is to do that through PGO. And I think that could be one of the bigger compiler improvements of, of recent times. Because in some, in many, like there's been big changes in Go in terms of toolchain that improve performance. Like um, when we switched to the register calling convention uh, some time ago. Also when PGO landed itself uh, as it is, which I think was like a 5% improvement in some cases. But I think a better inliner is going to be another big, maybe not double digit, but certainly noticeable improvement in performance. A bunch of single digit improvements add up to double digit improvements over time though, don't they? Yeah. And it also depends on what kind of software you're writing. If you're writing software that just like does a lot of CPU logic and function calls and conditionals and stuff, in better inlining is going to unlock a lot of improvements because with the compiler you have these situations where you know you cannot for example simplify some boolean expression because part of it goes to a function call right so if you can inline things then other compiler imp- improvements can sort of kick in again yeah i think you have tools today even before pgo landed you could really push performance if your like application was data intensive, you could use uh, Arrow with Go, right? We had that uh, person on the on the show, and you could use profiling. And the language is was already minded towards performance, and it's kind of uh, at, at least for me, I'm, I'm wondering when we will stop. Like, when are we getting to the point where okay, we cannot improve a Go runtime anymore in terms of performance? So every time they, I, I hear someone go, oh, we can take a look at this part and improve that part. And I'm like, oh, right. <laughs> I'm wondering mm-hmm. when uh, the law of diminishing re- returns will kick into play and it would be better to focus on um, other areas. But I guess faster is faster. You can't argue with that. There's definitely a trade-off. And Go is, Go is not like the languages like C++ or Rust where they say the optimization is king in terms of we don't care if compile times get slower. Because in, in Go, there is there is that trade-off um, that, that is very much at play. And they have rejected compiler optimization steps that would be too expensive, just because they say, maybe we think this will make programs 1% faster, but it's also going to make compile times 50% slower. To us, that's not a good trade-off. So, so Go is not a micro-optimization language. Uh, but at the same time, if you have spent enough time optimizing your Go code with pprof, with tracing, with whatever else, you will have run into the limits of how fast the language can go, right? And I think one of the one of those biggest limits right now is the inliner just being 
too simple, bad. Um, because for example, if you have a hot path that just spends a ton of time calling out to other functions, because calling functions is, is relatively expensive if you do it enough times, right? If, if that is your biggest contributor to a hot path, you cannot get rid of it unless you manually inline the function call, which is a pain. It's a pain to maintain. It's a pain to do, right? So I definitely think that's this is a good thing uh, to, to improve the inliner. So you can improve the inliner for everyone, but it's also cool that you can use PGO for your own uh, projects, right? Like it's not only let's use PGO to improve the inliner, you can take, even now you can take uh, profiles and shove them into PGO and get your own compiler working better. Yep. And I, and this is a bit meta, but the way Go122 builds the tool chain, such as the compiler and the linker, it uses PGO itself. So PGO made the compiler about 5% faster. <laughs> <laughs> There's no better uh, dog food than that, right? Um, cool. Daniel, before we let you go, we have one stumper question. We ask all our interviewees. Uh, you're the second <laughs> because it's a new one from last year. Uh, last year, we asked everyone what feature would they add and what feature would they remove. And because we had so much interviews, we pretty much ended up with the entire issue backlog uh, on both sides of the, uh, of the <laughs> equation, right? Both let's remove it and let's add it. So what we want to ask is, when you started learning Go, you mentioned it was 10 years ago almost. What was most challenging for you or surprising? It's a good question. I came from Python and Java. I I guess what struck me the most is how quickly I was able to learn and get going. Because I remember learning Python and learning Java, and it took me maybe a couple of weeks before I felt like I could walk, right? Because I I just spent way too much time Look, reading tutorials and reading documentation and, and looking at, at errors. Whereas with Go, I think it only took me like three hours before I, I was writing an HTTP server. And, and yes, I came from other languages, so I already knew how to program. But to me, it was super refreshing how I could just run with it fairly quickly. And that is what hooked me. I, I am not a patient person. I am not a very intelligent person in terms of like mathematics or like complex languages and borrow checkers and stuff like that. So for me, being able to just run and get on with it is, is very important. Cool. I can definitely resonate with that. I, I also, before I started Go, I started with C++. You could read a file 10 times and not be 100% sure what every, you know, template, macro, whatever it does. It looks like you needed to be really, really smart to figure it out. And then I joined the team that does Go, and I was actually the team lead, and I never did Go before. I was like, okay, I have to understand that code really quickly. I read it, and I was like, okay, I, d- I just understand what's written here. Uh, line by line, it makes sense. And, and I think the biggest part of that is the human aspect. I don't, I'm not a software engineer to be an expert at languages and compilers, right? I'm a software engineer mainly, like my main contribution to my company is, is the human aspect and, and code reviews and, and designing and stuff. It's, it's not fighting the macros and the compiler and macro optimizing things. At least that's the way I see my profession. Very cool. If people want to find you, reach out, what should they follow? What links should they look at? How can they get in contact with you? Um, so I think the main two social profiles that I have, if you will, one of them is GitHub, MVDAN. And the other one is Blue Sky, which I believe is domain-based, so at mvdan.cc. Very cool. We'll have links to both of those in the show notes. Daniel, thanks for coming on. It's been a real pleasure talking to you about a wide variety of topics. Thanks a lot. Thanks to you for having me. That's a very cool podcast you have here. Great. Thank you. Thanks.